Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, South Africa. My name is Dr. Clinton Carter-Brown. I am head of the Energy Center here at the CSIR, and it's really my honor and privilege uh, to be conducting today's panel on energy, a very topical discussion, um, something that we're doing a lot of deep research in at the CSIR in terms of our science base and research and the energy transition in the country and the great opportunities uh, that this presents us as a country and as a region in terms of the rest of Africa. Um, today I'm joined by an esteemed panel. Uh, I think we, we are all very acutely aware of some of the realities uh, that we've been faced recently in terms of a very constrained electricity power system. We've seen that play out in terms of national load shedding. Um, and a lot of it can become very depressing in, in many respects in terms of the implications of that on our economy. Um, but the really good news and, and where we're going to focus today and our discussion as a panel is a lot of the opportunity that perhaps many of us aren't aware that this wonderful energy transition is going to present us, not just in terms of decarbonizing the South African energy system and mitigating some of the impacts in terms of climate change, but also making energy not just cleaner, but cheaper and more sustainable and creating jobs and driving local economic development in the process. A and we are really at the cusp of a magnificent opportunity um, to grow this new emerging energy sector in South Africa and on the continent. So a lot of opportunity ahead. Um, and uh, we're going to start with uh, a presentation by one of our panelists and go into some Q&A and would really welcome and appreciate your questions as the audience. What are the questions that you have on this very important topic that, topic that we can engage on? Uh, but without further ado, just to introduce uh, the panelists for today to you. Um, first, I'm going to start with uh, Mr. Nantlantla and Giri. Nantlantla, very well known to us within the industry. He is head of, of electricity and energy at the South African Local Government Association, SALGA, working very closely with the municipalities on the energy transition and the opportunities. Next is Ms. Alia Kasim. She is a director in the microeconomics policy team focused on network industries at the National Treasury. We then have online uh, Ms. Mandy Rambros, who is ESCOM's Climate Change and Sustainability Manager at ESCOM. She is also heading up ESCOM's new Just Energy Transition Office, which is really overseeing the ESCOM role in terms of the energy transition, with specific focus on the repurposing and reuse of the ESCOM coal-fired power stations. We are also joined by Dr. Dee Fisher, who is a Chief Director in the Environmental Management Support Section at the Department of Environmental Affairs, Forestries and Fisheries. And finally, last but not least, Dr. Jared Wright, who works with me in the CSR Energy Center. Dr. Wright is a Principal Researcher in our Energy Systems Group, looking at the longer-term energy systems modeling and the integration of renewable energy technologies into the South African power system. So a warm welcome to the panelists. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for taking your time out and engaging today on this important topic. Um, I'll then hand over to Dr. Wright to take us through some introductory slides. Thank you, Jared. Uh, thank you, Chair, and um, welcome, everyone. A bit of a different conference this year. Um, I'll just try and provide some perspective in a few slides. So I'll take around 10 minutes, uh, hopefully some interesting discussion points, uh, starting with the immediate and the reality of load shedding that we have experienced in the recent past and a very constrained power system, moving more towards the longer term uh, opportunities around decarbonization. Then also then moving towards asking the bigger question around what about the full energy sector? What about all the other ways in which we use energy and the opportunities there around decarbonizing the rest of the energy sector in the long term? And hopefully some visionary blue sky thinking uh, from a research institution like uh, the CSIR. So uh, without any further delay, um, I am limited on time. Uh, I'll just walk you through these two slides around the load shedding that we have experienced in the last decade. Um, it is unfortunate, but an unfortunate reality that we have had to deal with. Um, we have moved, in unfortunately, from crisis to crisis over the past 10 years, of which in the past two, um, there have been some of the worst years in terms of the intensity of the load shedding that we've seen. It's now time that we get this right. 
Uh, I think it is uh, uh, an opportune time where we're starting to rethink, reimagine, and uh, recalibrate uh, the way in which we work and our economies. So this is really a perfect time to do that. So as part of some of the research that CSR recently published on this, actually will be later in the CSR conference uh, um, later this morning, um, we really talked to some solutions around um, solving this load shedding problem that we're in, of which this is really a quick summary of that. Um, we defined it in terms of three solutions, so without stopping at the problem that is load shedding that I was talking to now, really talking to three uh, steps as part of the solution. A customer response at scale, so this is really the distributed and embedded generation component to try and really increase supply capacity and reduce the level of constraints on the power system. Of course, this is not the only step, it is just one step, but it will have an immediate impact of reducing load shedding from um, 2021 onwards hopefully even sooner. Um, step two and step three, though, are actually uh, existing government policy, of which the one is the DMRE Risk Mitigation Power Purchase Procurement Program. Um, as part of that, we really need to accelerate that process as much as possible to address the remaining gap uh, after the um, step three, which I'll talk to next, uh, to ensure that we have as an adequate supply of electricity. In terms of the research that we did, though, uh, we, did, we were quite um, ambitious. We said that this capacity will come online in 2022. It's actually needed in 2021 already, but the reality in terms of procurement processes and lead times of the technologies that are being procured means that it's likely only to come online from 2022, which really then requires more from step one, for example, um, as well as then from uh, step three, which I'll talk to next. So step three then is really just the implementation of our existing policy, which is the Integrated Resource Plan 2019, um, in the Integrated Resource Plan 2019, um, there is a range of capacity that is expected from solar PV to wind to storage. There's even new built coal as well as um, uh, uh, gas in the middle of the decade. Now, as part of that, uh, the research that we published was really focusing on ensuring ministerial determinations are made, of which they have been made. It's now about implementing and getting those processes um, rolling. All of this, of course, uh, has to be done in parallel. This cannot be done sequentially. We have to be doing all three of these steps together. So the customer response at scale, the DMRE risk mitigation procurement program, as well as the implementing the RP 2019. So then, once we've overcome the, el the electricity crisis, which we will, what then? And this is really some research we did in the middle of this year that we published around long-term planning of in the power sector, and specifically around decarbonization of the power sector. And what we really wanted to ask, if you look at this graphic that I'm showing here, is as a function of the total cost, as well as then the CO2 emissions in the power sector, how steep is that curve on the left as we move from least cost down in terms of carbon emissions over the entire time frame? Is it quite flat? Is it quite steep? So how much more will it cost us to decarbonize? Will it be very expensive? Will it not be very expensive? And then what ways in which, what, what manners in which can we, can we finance uh, that additional cost in terms of the uh, power system carbon ambitions that we may have? And this is really a summary of the range of scenarios that we explored, of which uh, you can look at in your own time, but it's really about what would an accelerated rollout of renewables, which seem to be part of this least cost mix, combined with the complementary fleet of coal and gas and storage, uh, mean for CO2 emissions and cost? Um, all the way from the left-hand side, the RP 2019, to a reference scenario and least cost scenario, and then more towards modest and ambitious uh, renewable energy industrialization programs uh, in the medium to long term. What we found, though, interestingly enough, if you look on the left-hand side here, absolute uh, terms, so in billions of rands, as well as in CO2 emissions in gigatons, and then on the right-hand side, a relative change, which is just a percentage change, the same information, just presented on relative versus absolute terms is that it's actually not that much more expensive to decarbonize relative to least cost. In the order of 3 to 4%, uh, in order to really reduce our CO2 emissions by in the order of 50% relative to that reference scenario. So now we really need to ask ourselves, does this then clear a path for decarbonization? Very likely, but at least from a least cost perspective, we will definitely be reducing our CO2 emissions, but we could do a lot more. There's a lot more that we can do. So I've spoken about the power sector. Now, what about all of the other energy carriers and all the other ways in which we use energy in the country? And that's really uh, what this slide is trying to talk to. In terms of a status quo, this is a Sankey diagram or an energy flow diagram of the country 
uh, from 2015 based on uh, DMRE uh, uh, official information and data. And what you really see from the left-hand side there in terms of domestic production is our energy is dominated by coal. Uh, coal for power generation, coal for exports, as well as coal for um, liquid fuel production. We also then use gas for liquid fuel production. We import a lot of oil as well as liquid fuel products for our transportation sector. Electricity is used in a range of our end, end use um, sectors, commercial, industrial, residential, and agricultural. But in the residential sector specifically, we still use a lot of biomass. Now, the real question here is, well, I've only really covered that one component that I'm highlighting there, which is less than one third of our total energy end use is actually in electricity. Now, if we can easily decarbonize the power sector, let's try to electrify every other sector to try and make sure that we get to that least cost outcome and a decarbonized outcome in the long term. So increasing levels of electrification and electrification in the sense of using electricity in all of those sectors, but also increased electrification in South Africa's context in terms of ensuring universal electricity access so that everyone has access to that electricity and then can provide or use that electricity for the end services that they need to. So just in terms of this slide and the next slide, and then I'll finalize, our direct emissions by sector in terms of energy is really dominated by electricity, as I was mentioning, dominated by coal, but then followed by transportation and industrial end use. I've put some of the statistical um, information there for your reference, but just for example, in the electricity sector, 50 to 55 percent of our CO2 emissions uh, comes from that, uh, whilst only 20 to 25 to 30 percent of our energy end use is in electricity at the moment. So decarbonization of electricity is a clear focus area. The other um, major areas, industrial and transportation, um, contribute 10 to 12 percent of our energy sector CO2 emissions, but 25 to 27 percent of our energy end use. And then for industrial activities, um, 15 to 20 percent of our energy sector CO2 equivalent emissions, um, but uh, using about 35 to 40 percent of our energy. So I just wanted one last slide, uh, if I move forward to the next one, just in the interest of time, but really to focus on, we've got high renewable potential in the electricity sector, very cost competitive and theoretically an unlimited technical potential as a result of the cost of these technologies as well as land availability. So now how do we decarbonize heating or the industrial sector for the most part, as well as transportation? For the most part, biomass and biofuels are limited and you, don't w you do not want them to compete with food security. So you really need to do that sector coupling and couple them with electricity, whether it's directly or indirectly via energy carriers like hydrogen. And that's why this last slide really talks to that. So from the left to the right hand side, really using electricity at the core of our energy sector, generating hydrogen as well as hydrogen based products, power to liquids and power to gas type technologies for a combination of either hydrogen fueled vehicles, electric vehicles, transportation as well as power to liquids, so still using liquid fuels, but based on synthetic fuels from renewables based electricity. And at the end of the day, then really taking that electricity and using it in the he for, for heating in industrial processes or using hydrogen for those industrial processes where high-grade process heat is required. So in the interest of time, I will leave this slide up, uh, but this is really just some discussion points and key takeaways perhaps for the rest of the discussion. We really want to solve this crisis. We need to take the least, regress moves, least regret moves and invest in renewable energy. There's really no more trade-offs around cost versus CO2 and emissions. And it's really only slightly more expensive to be a bit more ambitious on carbon. We need to sector couple. Clean hydrogen is a component of that. And of course, at the end of the day, we do need to ensure that the enabling policy, financial support, uh, and financial support is there to then incentivize the innovation that's necessary to ensure that the institutions and technologies are rolled out and deployed uh, in the country. So thank you. And uh, hopefully that uh, provides some fruitful discussion for the rest of the session. Uh, thanks, Dr. Rat. I think that certainly does. Um, very, very interesting context and overview. And, and perhaps just to, just to, you know, in terms of a country, we, we, are, we are poised in terms of opportunity here. We, we have a l large land mass. We have lots of areas of the country that are well suited for the development of these new sustainable renewable energy technologies. Um, and we're also blessed with lots of year-round sun and wind. We also have a lot of the minerals um, that one would new use, for example, in new technologies, advanced batteries. Um, we have a large automotive sector that could transition and produce electric vehicles. We, we are set as a country um, to be the leader um, on the continent and to be an exporter of these technologies into the continent and, and globally. So, so a world of opportunity ahead. 
but it's a major change. Um, it's a very, very different power system that is driven by renewable energies that takes that into transportation and heat. So a lot of economic opportunity, a lot of cross-linking, um, but will also require us to, to, to do things differently. Um, it, it, and, and the scale of, of what needs to be done is, is quite remarkable. Um, and certainly from an environmental impact perspective, um, Dr. Deep Fisher, there's, there's, there's a lot of, of linking there in terms of, of getting ready or being prepared to be able to develop projects of this scale in these time frames. What is the department doing in terms of DEFF um, to support the development of this new industry? Um, thank you. Yes, I think we've been working, um, looking at the uh, facilitatory regulatory environmental framework uh, since about 2014, where we made some amendments to the uh, EIA regulations, uh, where we could look at um, a f uh, interlinked um, uh, facilities like your renewable energy facility, your power line, and your substation, and uh, authorize those under one application. Um, but then have three different authorizations, which then could be uh, split off into, uh, for example, ESCOM, if it was for the power line or the substation. Um, you're just using a part one amendment, which just is a, an administrative amendment, so it doesn't go through uh, a very long extended process. Uh, we've also been looking at strategic environmental assessments, where we've been looking at environmental sensitivity and the ability to look at renewables in specific areas. Um, and these have given us um, quite a few support, uh, decision support tools, as we call them, uh, which is uh, looking at we've, we've identified corridors for energy generation, uh, for power grid and, and gas pipeline uh, specifically. And then we've also got, um, uh, we've identified a significant number of renewable energy development zones where we'd like to facilitate um, a renewable energy pro uh, projects. Um, this also provides ESCOM with um, a, a node for pr proactive uh, grid uh, investment, um, if they wanted to do that. Uh, we've looked at um, amending the processes, so a more streamlined process, a basic assessment process, rather than um, the longer process of the scoping. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've also looked at re uh, reducing the review time frames from the department point of view. So we've managed to get a 70% uh, reduction in time frames wow. um, from, uh, from what we had before. Uh, we've got a number of generic EMPRs, environmental management programs, out, which means that a developer doesn't have to uh, continuously uh, produce um, environmental management plans. They can use a standard plan, and they just have to uh, agree to implement those plans, which also saves a lot of time and review time frame from uh, time from the department. We've just um, gazetted a standard for comment uh, for the exclusion of power lines from EIA altogether um, based on um, doing uh, a complying to a standard. And there's uh, additional scope for PV um, there as well, although we haven't uh, tackled that yet, but there is that additional mm. scope. Um, then we've also got the screening tool, which is looking at, uh, it, it, it identifies uh, environmental sensitivity of an area so you could go in and have a look at the environmental sensitivity of a site and from there you can assess uh, the kind of complications that your EIA process will provide you and right from the beginning you can start eliminating sites and go to sites with less environmental sensitivity which then can also streamline your process and make it uh, uh, faster. We've then also provided for compliance statements rather than assessment reports. Uh, mm. So if you're building in an area of low sensitivity, you're able to just produce a compliance statement, which is, is it, it saves a huge amount of time and effort, um, but it is um, tailor-made for the sensitivity, environmental sensitivity of okay. the site. So, so we're not reducing any kind of um, um, protection, but we're just uh, making mm. sure that everything is um, as you know at the level that it should be. We've also clarified um, the situation with batteries, uh, if there is an EIA required, and there is no EIA required on battery storage if it's part of your process. Um, and then um, I think, yes, as I've mentioned, there's additional scope for, um, for, um, uh, for more strategic environmental assessments around the ESCOM power stations to facilitate um, a more streamlined process for the, um, for the repurposing of those Great. power stations when we get there. Um, and also the opportunities in terms of a post-mining environment. If we can actually look at 
a win-win situation between PV, mining rehabilitation, and water treatment. Um, I think there's some win-wins that we could actually um, get in, in terms of that. And we've got three renewable energy development zones in post-mining environments now. So it's a, it's a great opportunity for us to actually um, investigate the opportunities that that would provide. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Great, excellent. Uh, thanks, Dr. Fisher. And, and I, uh, you know, I must say that I think the department's really to be commended for the very proactive um, route. And, and I think what Dr. Fisher's summarized in a few minutes has been at least six, seven, eight years of, of sustained work um, to have a very proactive approach around managing the environmental impacts and making it easier um, for projects to be developed in South Africa on scale um, and, and as networked deeply within the industry. A lot still to be done, but but thanks very much for 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 the work there. You you've touched on 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 the linking to sort of post mining landscapes and and the the sort of repurposing and the linkages to to ESCOM and its coal fleet. Maybe I'll 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 bring Mandy you in there in terms of um, the work the work from ESCOM's perspective. I mean we know that ESCOM is operating a a very large um, coal fired power station fleet. Um, and that some of it is reaching end of life, um, and that needs to be carefully managed as part of this transition. Uh, maybe if you could share with us some of the ESCOM perspectives and the journey so far and, and where, where you see that going. Thanks very much, uh, Clinton, and thank you so much to Jared and to, to Dee for, for their presentations as well. I think it, it perfectly lays the, the ground for what I want to talk about. The repurposing and repowering, I think, is a very exciting opportunity in the, in the midst of a crisis. And in the midst of you know, the, the social issues around uh, shutting down power plants, I think there's an exciting opportunity to turn all of that around. And I'm glad Jared's been so optimistic about the future. And you know, all of the stuff that Dee just spoke about is extremely positive in terms of how we can enable these processes going forward. So our thinking then from an ESCOM perspective, and when we talk about just transition, the just is as important as the transition. So the lower carbon future, pursuing a green future is a no brainer, as I always say, you know, um, the numbers that Jared showed you in terms of new renewables versus new coal is uh, the new renewables are cheaper. So it makes complete sense from a business perspective to go that way. But I think just as important is making sure that we have the socioeconomic development as well. So I think from a repurposing and repowering perspective, um, that is exactly what the, the opportunity is is how do we continue to stimulate economic growth in those areas? Um, you know you know that people know the area as well, Komati Port, Pullins, Hope, where there isn't much happening. And as we shut down those plants, I think that situation gets worse. So we're looking at how do we stimulate economic development and how do we continue to make sure there's social upliftment in the area? So I think when we look at repurposing and repowering and, and I'm particularly making those distinctions, because with repowering, you know, I think that's an obvious thing that we would do. How do we uh, stimulate those power stations in, in that we reuse them to produce electricity, have the revenue stream and continue to pro provide power in the area. So looking at renewables, uh, looking at gas and battery storage and what are the various options. But I think repurposing itself also has a very exciting opportunities in terms of how do we look at what are other purposes that we could use those that land for. And they're not mutually exclusive. You know, you could look at repowering commodity power station with PV and battery storage. Plus, can you look at agricultural activities on the land? Can you look at manufacturing training activities on the land? Um, you know, so those are the kinds of ideas and opportunities uh, we're looking for. And then it's about creating sustainable jobs. You know, it's not jobs just that for today and tomorrow we have people that are unemployed. But how do you look at not just repowering, repurposing and stimulating um, electricity production and other purposes, but creating really uh, sustainable jobs in, in the area? And I think, you know, for me, one of the, the biggest opportunities here is collaboration. If you look at the people on, your, on the panel and where we all come from, vastly different areas, but if we all work in collaboration together, I think we can make this transition a very positive thing. Not one of us in, in our organizations can do this alone. Um, so the enablers we're looking at is uh, collaboration, you know, with whether it's DTIC, with DEF, uh, with people like the CSIR in municipalities. Um, and then also the other enablers are financing um, and, and looking at 
things, not just approvals and authorizations, but things like licensing. How can we get that done uh, quicker? So I think uh, what I would like to say, you know, just, just to close off this bit, is that I think it's something we need to work on collaboratively. We need to look at what the enablers are. There will always be barriers, but we need to talk about how we overcome those barriers and um, you know, look at positives towards going forward in the transition. Thanks, Clinton. I'll stop there. And, and to make sure that it is a just transition uh, and not just a transition, because I think we all know the economics of the transition and the least cost planning points uh, to, to, to one future, and that is lots of PV and wind. Um, but in the process, I think we've seen what happened, for example, in some of the mining areas, specifically with gold um, and some of the devastating socioeconomic consequence of an unplanned um, you know, withdrawal from, from certain sectors. So, so we, we need to, to, to plan this. And, and, and thanks to, to, to ESCOM and the leadership there uh, in terms of how that is being managed with, with all spheres of, of, of government. And, and as you say, it's in collaboration. Um, and, and that links very strongly to what you were saying around job creation and, and creating these new economies um, through, through the new uh, green sectors that are being created. So that brings me earlier to, to a question there around, you know, what is the likely impact of decarbonization on the South African economy? I mean, we know that the South African economy, you know, badly needs to grow uh, and we need the stimulus. What would the role of, of decarbonization renewable energy be in that? Thanks, and thanks to the panel for the interesting insights that have been shared so far. Um, well, I mean, transitioning is inevitable, and the economic impact really depends on the pace and scale of decarbonization. Um, in South Africa, a number of our key trading commodities are particularly at risk um, as a global economy transitions away from fossil fuel uh, power, and uh, this, this puts um, pressure on the country's balance of trade, and we've already seen financial uh, disinvestment from fossil fuel-based power production, um, and it's really now about managing those societal and environmental risks. And, and potentially, uh, just looking at our balance of trade, we, we could look at what type of exports we could fill, we could fill the gap with. So, um, you know, is it renewable energy components that can be exported into Africa? Is it alternate fuels? And I mean, internationally, we've seen that green investments provide a higher economic return. They boost the manufacturing and related services sector mm. and construction sectors, and that leads to employment growth, and that supports economic growth, which we desperately need. Uh, we've des we, we desperately need it before the crisis. Um, so these are even more unprecedented times um, where we need to think outside of the box. And in the long term, I think decarbonization has a number of benefits in terms of um, less emissions and less pollution, which leads to a healthier population. And I think now we've seen the importance of having a healthy, healthier population and there's cost savings related to that. And also, um, you know, this feeds into more productive capital processes. Um, and, you know, so research has shown that the renewable energy sector could create 1.6 million jobs by 2050. Um, there's opportunities for FDI. There's opportunities, um, I've mentioned the export opportunities, um, and obviously there's growth areas like electric vehicles, the hydrogen economy, um, green buildings, um, and, 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 and a host of others, which I'm sure we'll get to later. Uh, but obviously, mm. I, I definitely agree with um, Mandy in that, you know, so the, the acute problems that South Africa faces is the high unemployment rate and poverty and inequality. And we have to, so, uh, mm. the, 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 so how we deal with decarbonization has to, has, to, has to take into account the just transition. And the solution has to be inclusive where there's a social compact. Um, and I suppose there are interesting models all over the world that are being followed using blended finance to sort of transition away from fossil fuels, but at, at the same time still protecting livelihoods. And I think those plans need to be implemented, or these, those plans need to be put together um, immediately so that we're not reactive in the situation, because mm -hmm. um, that could have a very um, negative impact on the economy. Thanks, Alia. And, 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 and that, that, that unpacking of that at grassroots level in terms of, of, of protecting everyone in the process and making sure that people have meaningful jobs and that we create jobs, 
um, is, is perhaps something that, that really um, transitions at the local municipal level. Because Nantanta, that's where a lot of the challenge or, or the tacky hits the tar. Um, you know, municipalities sit with the challenges of service provision. They sit with the realities of, 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 of the economic growth and the opportunities there, but also the consequences um, if things aren't well managed. So, so it, 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 it's great to see South African municipalities not, not just wanting to be part of, of, of this transition and opportunity, but in many cases <coughs> actively standing up and wanting to drive that process and, and to own it and be part of it. Maybe just to share from a Salga perspective um, the opportunities and, and what, what's being done in that space. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Clinton. Um, quite an interesting conversation. Thank you to the panel as well for the insights. Um, yes, you know, um, you know, starting from the adoption of the transition uh, by local government, I think it's something that happened even before my time at Salga. If you look at Salga between 2012 and 2013, Salka already developed um, a renewable energy, energy efficiency strategy. Mm. So to mm -hmm. guide municipalities to take them through the transition, because I think uh, my, my predecessors, they, they actually saw this coming and wanted to prepare the municipalities to actually, uh, you know, go with the transition. So the adoption of the transition for municipalities is not just something that's happened recently. I think it's been happening, but more uncoordinated. I think before we hosted the summit of 2018, then when we hosted the summit of 2018, that's where we wanted to determine the outlook or the energy um, uh, roadmap for local government going to the future. And that is where we identified a lot of uh, business uh, model that municipalities could actually engage in. Lots of opportunities and you know I think we, what we need to be careful of because I will talk uh, I will talk to no less than 10 business models that are possible but w what we need to be careful of is when you are overwhelmed by opportunities and not know where to start it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. The bus misses you. Mm -hmm. So we have to all work with municipalities especially as Salka as the representative with all our partners to make sure that municipalities know where to start because the transition now, even the policy itself, presents a lot of opportunities for municipalities. I'm going to start, uh, in the interest of time, let me just go through quickly. Um, you look at the need to have smart cities at this point in time. If you want to have smart mm -hmm. city, you're not just talking about the electricity department or the energy department. You must talk about the whole value chain of the municipality. And when you talk about the whole value chain of a municipality, you start from the town planning itself. What is going to happen from the buildings, new buildings going forward and the old building? The town planning needs to talk about that, where energy con is concerned, where the greening is concerned, decarbonization as well. So mm -hmm. town planning needs to play a bigger role around that. You look at the waste services of municipalities. They must have a strategy around taking things forward where energy is concerned. Talk about transportation. Transportation, a lot of municipalities are bringing back the bus services. There is no reason for those buses to be used in fossil fuels if we are bringing back the bus rapid tra transit system. There are a lot of opportunities around there. You look at the, um, the electricity, I mean the electric vehicles, a business model there, a municipality could actually trade power and have charging stations. That's a business model. Mm. Look at the water department. Every value chain of the municipality needs to have energy efficiency and greening strategy within it. Mm. The, the, the waterworks lose mm. a lot of energy as well. Mm. So, and you need to actually have a strategy on how are you going to ensure that you're using one clean energy, you're actually even doing energy efficiency uh, using the waterworks or the waterworks equipment. Lots of uh, grant, uh, infrastructure grants that are actually pumped into all these infrastructure services, they need to be channeled towards transitioning to cleaner um, use of energy mm. as well. As you can see, I haven't even talked about the electricity department. Yeah. It's just the whole value chain. Now going to the electricity department itself, let me move quickly in the interest of time. Um, we, we have municipalities right now that can build their own generation. Obviously, 
looking at the, the ESCOM tariffs as it stands now, there could be opportunities to offset that you know, um, tariff, not just because we want to get rid of ESCOM. ESCOM is playing a big part in the, in the country's uh, power system, and they will still be playing a bigger part, but we need to integrate because we are moving. I think the transition is happening a lot in municipalities, so we have to make sure that we take everyone with us, including even ESCOM as well, but make sure that we balance because even when we have our own generation as municipalities, we're still going to need ESCOM when the sun is not shining or when the wind is not blowing as well. So we need to balance the system. So the, the need for everyone is there. We, municipalities could even procure right now. So you can defer CAPEX because we know CAPEX is an issue in municipalities. You could procure from independent power producers so as to actually make sure that you are, you are allowing the growth that has been impeded well by you know, the capacity you know, strategies that we have right now, uh, which means that some municipalities are not growing as fast as they want. Uh, mm -hmm. Some uh, capacity constraint also not allowing municipalities to extend on their networks. But you could have, you know, renewable energy uh, solutions addressing those, those issues. Um, network services, municipalities can start selling their networks now. Mm -hmm. uh, they could start uh, trading. They could start, have, uh, you know, willing uh, for... Um, independent power producers who are selling to their customers. So not necessarily that if the, their customers are now buying from IPPs that they are using revenue, they are losing revenue. They could still make money using the network charges or the wheeling charges. Um, bridging net agents, the municipalities could be integrators. All those who are building power around municipal areas, municipalities could be integrators and actually trade if they were well capacitated to do that, 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 that uh, um, uh, task. Energy advisory services, you could provide that to your customers. Energy audits, all of that. That's a new opportunity in municipalities. Um, integrated energy packages. Um, we have uh, INEP right now, which is still extending um, the grid. Um, I don't see a reason why we're still extending the grid when there is uh, solar panels, where we could have integrated energy packages. Uh, municipalities could still get into a space where they offer higher purchase energy packages and install solar panels to their own customers and have a contract with their customers paying over a certain period of time until they're done. Um, I, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, battery storage to take care of the peak hours cost and, and, and they could actually install that also in their system. And lastly, what is currently happening now and what is picking up fast, small-scale embedded, genera uh, 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 embedded generation, where they are actually installing roof in, um, solar in their rooftops and allowing even their customers to, to sell back to them. So that's a new business model. It's, it's endless opportunities, but municipalities must know where to start because they might miss the bus. And I think Salka is well-positioned to actually take a take on that role. And we are doing that through an action plan that came out of the 2018 Energy Summit, where we are taking the municipalities with us, making sure that they know where to start in order to take advantage of all these opportunities. And um, sorry, I take too much time. Ah, no, no, the <laughs> passion and the, and, and, and the opportunity comes through yeah. strongly in I, I, you know, and I, and I think if there's youngsters out there that are, are, are in, in sitting in school or, or even heading off to university and are wondering, you know, what career to follow. Um, if you've just been listening to what Nantlantla was showing, I mean, we, we are headed for, for massive growth and change and opportunity within this energy transition. So there is so much very interesting, wonderful things to do that scale from the enterprise level, from entrepreneurs that want to get in and create new products and services through to the economists. There, there is so much great work to be done. Thanks, Nantlantla. And maybe before we, we, we cut to the audience in terms of your questions, um, uh, uh, Dr. Rat, Jared, the, 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 the scale of the opportunity here, um, I mean, we, we've, we, we've installed a certain amount of renewable energy through the REAP program in the last seven years. But the CSR analysis that you uh, and, and uh, Joe and Carlitz have done uh, very clearly shows that, that we will be able to, or we will need to build out substantially more amounts of this renewable energy. Maybe you have your thoughts there, just to get that understanding of the scale of the opportunity that resides in the years ahead. Yeah, um, that was actually one of the more interesting findings. Um, although I spoke to the opportunity around uh, decarbonization and it actually won't cost that much more, the real interesting finding was the pace and scale at which therefore we would then need to roll out this type of infrastructure. 
uh, specifically on solar PV and wind. Um, in the order of three to four times what we have already done in the past five to seven years. So every year we are going to be need to needing to install three to four gigawatts of each of these technologies, depending on the uh, share, and you can obviously optimize around that. Um, sure. Some other findings that we, that we are also going to explore a lot further going forward, I'll just quickly touch on them before we go to the Q&A, is um, asking the question, you know, w should we be putting a lot of these assets then in the areas where perhaps the resource is the best, so the solar in the Northern Cape or the wind in the Eastern Cape and Western Cape, or should we be prioritizing areas, for example, that have been spoken to by um, uh, Dr. Fisher as well as then uh, Mandy around maybe putting some of those assets into uh, where the coal stations are going to be decommissioned or repurposed or retrofitted, and asking then, well, are we willing to pay that slight premium as a um, contribution almost uh, to a just transition discussion? And that's really some of the questions that we'd like to answer ne next. But I think in the interest of time, we can go to Q&A and perhaps some more questions will come through. Awesome. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. The first question is for Dr. Wright. How does the recent media statement from NASA uh, confirming the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy has approved the NASA process license applications for self-generation facilities of one megawatt even if they are not in compliance with the integrated resource plan. So the question is, does this approval provide what is needed as a part of what you have proposed as phase one unlocking of embedded generation? Uh, look, in uh, that small scale embedded generation level and up to that one megawatt limit, um, you're really only going to get a certain type of customer or types of customers that are then going to deploy um, embedded generation. So that could be typical households or small businesses or commercial enterprises, the big malls in a lot of metropolitan um, areas. At the end of the day, though, in terms of making big impact in the immediate and averting load shedding and trying to remove the system constraints, you really need to de be deploying at scale. And the big impact comes from your energy intensive users, the mining houses and others, and if you can start to open that market up to allow those types of customers to self-generate, that's where you really make the big impact. And that will most definitely be more than one megawatt. By the way, it doesn't mean you cannot do that. You can still do that, but you do need to be licensed, which takes a particular process and also has time associated with that, of which we do not have much of. We do not have much time. And trying to talk to those three steps that we presented, you need to be doing all of that in parallel, and you need to be doing that all of, it, all of that at scale. And that's why we intentionally kept the word there, at scale. It's not just about the small generators and a lot of them. It's about that combined with the big um, intensive uh, energy users that will then be able to assist uh, in alleviating the immediate constraints and hopefully setting up for um, a successful decade ahead. The CSIR is passionate about energy and has created the Energy Center. What are some of the green energy offerings on the table, and when can we see them? I guess maybe I'll take that question. <laughs> Great question. Um, we're doing a lot of deep work at the moment, and, and we'll do more, um, and, and across a number of key technologies. Um, we are busy with the accreditation of our Solar PV Reliability Research Laboratory, uh, where we'll be providing R&D services and support to entrepreneurs and local assemblers, specifically to make sure that the local solar PV uh, equipment and infrastructure that's deployed in South Africa will, will work as intended in our conditions and under our operating conditions. So, so that is a new service and, and an exciting area that we're doing with our energy supply and demand team. Um, we, we, are, we are doing some fundamental research looking at, for example, offshore wind, uh, we know that we have a lot of um, onshore wind, um, uh, uh, you know, environmentally um, suitable areas, um, but we also have a, an excellent offshore wind uh, capability. So, so we are looking at, at what those economics might look like. Um, and, and we're doing some, some excellent deep fundamental work um, in batteries and battery chemistries. Um, some of the early lithium iron uh, development of technology was actually started within South Africa and within the CSIR. Um, and over the last 10 years, we've revisited our, our battery research, and we are in specific doing work in battery cathodes, uh, which is a big cost component of advanced batteries, um, looking to, to beneficiate South African minerals. We've got, for example, lots of manganese, and manganese is, is one of the key ingredients in terms of cathodes. So looking at how do we then create um, recyclable, sustainable, cost-effective 
batteries that are built on South African minerals that we can localize um, and deploy in South Africa and the region. So, so those are just some of the examples. Um, we're doing lots of, of work in other areas as well, um, but I thought it would be great to, to share those, those specific technologies where we're doing some fundamental work. Is Salva willing to pump funding into CSIR energy uh, research and development output? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> it is a great question. Um, uh, uh, understanding the funding model of Salka, I would say Salka is always willing and is currently doing that through international partners. Uh -huh. The international partners that we partner with who have the, who has the funding to push the energy agenda and we, we are always supportive of that. So mm. Yeah, yeah, and, and I must say, thanks to Nantlantla, they're all there. I mean, because it's teamwork. It's what Mandy was saying in terms of the collaboration. And, you know, there they, they, they are partners out there that, that, that Having the municipalities and having ESCOM and having the Department and Treasury all standing with us um, certainly makes it much easier then in terms of connecting these dots. All right, I think, th I think that then brings us to, to the end of the session. Thanks for those great questions and a special thanks to the panelists. Um, Jared, Alia, Dee, Nantlantla, it's, it's been a real honor and a, and a, and a privilege. It, it's amazing how this time has flown by. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love us to, to have another follow-up in a, in a year or two years' time um, and um, you know, see where, where we are with the transition. But thanks, everyone. Thanks for your participation. Just one more question. If you don't oh, sure. On decarbonization, is there an envisaged plan for what happens to the existing coal resources given the possible increased renewable energy penetration in the years to come? Maybe, Jared, you could touch on that. Um, and, and maybe also Mandy as well. I mean, it's a, it's a very topical question around mm -hmm. we've, we've got lots of coal and we built an economy on cheap coal um, when that was the technology of choice. When, when building large coal-fired power stations was the international norm and was the accepted and the most economic way of building out an energy system. And, and South Africa did it, did it very, very well. We built out a, a huge and some of the largest coal-fired power stations in the globe um, and with excellence. Um, and that has really driven our economy over many years. Um, and, and our electricity has been amongst the cheapest um, globally and still is uh, amongst the cheapest globally. And we must be clear on that. Despite the, the increases, um, you know, ESCOM have, have really um, done remarkably well over the last 30 years in terms of um, uh, coal-fired electricity. Uh, despite the immediate challenges in terms of some of the, the present availability. Um, but because we have a lot of coal still in the ground, um, we do then have a challenge in terms of how do you valorize it. And we're certainly seeing within the electricity or the power sector um, that even dirty um, electricity from coal is not cost effective relative to the new technologies. Uh, the, the renewable energy, the growth and the cost reduction in renewable energy technologies in the last seven years has been staggering. And, and as a country, that presents us a challenge. We, we've got a lot of it in the ground. Do we leave it in the ground, or what do we do with it? And certainly from an energy perspective, um, even if one takes the decarbonization elements out, it's a, it's, a, it's a very real challenge for us. And I think that's where the just transition element comes in, in terms of saying, what are going to be those new economies? Because building an economy on something that is, that, is, that is being phased out internationally. It's not just a South African problem, it's, a, it's an international global problem. Uh, there's a, there's a um, question actually uh, asking for timelines on local hydrogen power vehicles from HISA. From, from HISA. I don't know, do you, would you, any, anyone would like to take a, a, a stab there? Uh, look, I, I think it's, it's, it's a huge opportunity. I mean, HISA, the Hi Hydrogen South Africa, was started roughly 12 years ago. Um, three centers of competence. It's the Department of Science and, and um, Innovation um, program uh, that has been developing deep IP um, to, to essentially valorize our PGM. You know, as part of this hydrogen economy, um, you need to turn electricity into hydrogen by splitting water, and you turn that hydrogen um, back into electricity. Um, and or in order to do that, certain metal groups like, like palladium um, and platinum play a, a leading role in the present technology. So, and we have a lot of the global reserve there. 
So, so, so there's a huge opportunity for the country in terms of the hydrogen economy. Um, but I think we will need to to proverbially, you know, crawl, walk, and run. And and it's probably going to start with with fairly mature technologies like battery electric vehicles, um, and then it will transition into, for example, hydrogen electric vehicles. And as part of that, we need to create the local market and economy. So I think, like what Lantanta was talking to in terms of the transportation, when South African municipalities um, start to, to, to procure and implement new transportation systems where, for example, hydrogen fuel cells with high local content is a requirement, I think we'll really start to see that. And, and, and these technologies are commercially available now. They're not necessarily being manufactured in South Africa. So a lot about what we're talking about is then the localization and creating those new industries. So it, it would take us a year or two or three to get there, um, but certainly there's a lot of opportunity in that space. All right, I think that then brings us to the end of our time and, and our allotted slot. Um, if we could then uh, wrap up. Um, thanks very much, colleagues. Thanks for everything. Thank uh, anything further, Lionel, from, from the coordinators? Ah, oh, please, thank you. Over to you, Mandy. You, you can have the final word, please. Thanks. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't sure how to get your attention being online with the rest of you there. Um, but I think uh, for me, you know, the question, the previous question around what do we do with the coal? And I, I often use the quote that we, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And, and I'm not being glib about the, the coal situation. I think what's important, as you said, Clinton, is that we need a shift in mindsets and a shift in how we think about the world going forward. You know, this transition is happening. And if we don't step up, either as ESCOM or South Africa, we're actually going to be losing out. So I think the world is transitioning. And what's important for us to realize is that there are new opportunities, new industries that we need to get involved in, which is why the whole issue around, um, you know, transitioning and taking the opportunities and getting the local manufacturer for panels, for example, a local job creation, localization of these things is so important because we need to get on the bandwagon. Uh, otherwise we will be left behind. But just to add also that the transition is not something that's gonna happen overnight. You know, I know there's a lot of fear around job loss. It's not gonna happen overnight. It'll happen over time, but we actually need to get accelerated on it to get onto the pathway. So I think that's what's mainly needed is a mindset shift on where the opportunities lie in the country. Thanks. Super, wonderful, and, and well put. Thanks, Mandy. I think that's a great way to, to, to wrap up the session then. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, South Africa. Um, thanks for tuning in, and, and please you know, do continue. We've got some more interesting sessions coming up and, and on energy and other elements. Um, do, do dial in for them. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.